Now, let's look at this neurobiologically a little bit. So we're going to talk about a structure called the hypothalamus, which psychologists don't, human psychologists don't talk that much about because human psychologists are, what do you call them? They're corticocentric. You know, we need another thing to, what would you say, to resist prejudice against. And modern psychologists are prejudiced against non-cortical systems because they like to think that their prefrontal cortexes, which sort of separate them even from chimpanzees, are the important parts of the brain, and they're not. The important parts of the brain are these parts that are hardly even there at all. And they're really, really tiny. This is a rat brain, by the way. That's called a flat map. So it's like the brain's being flattened out. And this is the, the brain from the bottom. And these are really old, 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 old parts of a system called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus, man, it's important. If you take a cat and you take off its whole brain, limbic system, so to speak, cortex, you leave it with nothing but a spinal cord and the hypothalamus, which is so small you can hardly even see it, and it's a female cat, and you keep it in a cage, you can't even tell it doesn't have a brain. Because it can keep doing all the things that it did before. So it can mate, it can eat, it can drink, it can breathe, it can uh, defend itself, that's pretty cool, it can a engage in reproductive activity, it's like, there's a whole cat there. It's got a few problems. So one thing is it can't remember anything. So because it does, in fact, use its cortex to remember things. And the other thing is that it is, is it, that it is hyper exploratory. Now that's pretty weird because you'd think a cat with no brain wouldn't be exploratory at all. But what that indicates is that most of your brain is there to help you not explore things all the time. And the question is, what things should you not explore? And the answer to that is things you've explored before. Now, a cat with no brain can't remember what it explored before, so it's exploring everywhere, and it's hyper-exploratory, and so that's, and that's interesting. Now, the hypothalamus has two elements, roughly speaking, although, as you can see, there's a bunch of little sub-elements, and that's the hypothalamus over there on the left, too, and so it's not one thing, because nothing in the brain is one thing, no matter how you analyze it, if you keep analyzing it at higher and higher resolution, you find that it's more and more and more and more and more things. And so we give brain areas names, but the names don't correspond to homogeneity. And that's the case even with the hypothalamus. It's made out of a bunch of subsystems. And those subsystems do things like tell you when you're thirsty, but they do more than that because the hypothalamus isn't just a drive machine. So the hypothalamus not only tells you that you're thirsty by making you feel thirsty, but it also tunes your perception so that if you look at the world, you're much more likely to look at it as a world in which you could and should find water. And so as your hypothalamus determines that you don't have enough water in your blood, then your perceptions start to tune out everything that's irrelevant to water search and they, in, they, they um, also activate mechanisms that inhibit any kind of motor activities that would be associated with anything but the search for water. And what basically happens is that you see the world as a place to get water and then you go get water and then poof, the hypothalamus has you do something else because now you're hungry and then you're not hungry anymore and well now you're tired so then you go sleep and then you're you know sexually desirous and so hopefully you can do something about that. and. Uh, you know, then there's the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, and that's hypothalamic life. It's one damn thing after another. And so you're in a constant state of desire, and the desires change, but being in the state of desire is something that doesn't change. And you have to be in those states, because otherwise you die, and hypothetically you don't want to do that. And so evolution has made you very loath to die. Now, so that's interesting, and so you've got all these little monsters inside your head. Those are Freudian, like, id monsters that they don't drive you exactly. They set up these little stories that you live inside that make you act like a unidimensional cyclops in the search of some particular necessary biological goal. And so that's fine. But it's a bit more complicated than that, because what happens if your search fails? Well, you can't just grind to a halt like a computer would because then you die. You have to do something else when what you're doing doesn't work. And your brain's figured that out for you, which is kind of helpful. And the hypothalamus has actually figured it out because what happens when you don't get what you want is partly that you get anxious about it. And that's actually a newer system. And, and it's also painful, which is also a newer system. And we're not going to talk about that. You stop because it isn't working, so you should stop at least after some point, and then you explore. 
And what's so cool about the hypothalamus is that not only is it the system that tells you what to do when you know what to do, but it also is the system that tells you to do, tells you what to do when you don't know what to do. And what you do when you don't know what to do is to look around and explore. And what's cool about the hypothalamus is that the impulse to explore is just as old as the impulse to drink water or to eat or to engage in sexual activity or maybe even, maybe not, but maybe even to breathe. It's not epiphenomenal. It's way down there. It's an old, 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 old system. And so then you might ask yourself, well, if all of these little hypothalamic goal structures are games, and they are like the game of getting water. You know, you played the game of life when you were a kid, maybe if you're as old as me, and that was all about getting the necessities of life. That's your hypothalamus for you. But it also says, well, in the absence of certainty, explore. And so then that raises a, a couple of questions, and one question might be, well, you have these needs, we'll call them. They're more complicated than that. And one question is, well, what should be the relationship between them? What's more important? Well, part of the answer to that is, well, when, and over what time span, and with who, and those are really relevant questions because you're not alone, and good for you because you just die. And then the other question is, how are all these specific systems that are dedicated towards specific sub-goals to be construed in relationship to the goal of exploring? Now, because exploring, that's a weird process, right? Because when you explore, which is what you can do when you've made a mistake, let's say, or what you can do when you're bored, because what, if you're bored, why not explore? And what are you doing? Well, you're foraging, because when you explore, you use the same system that squirrels use to go find nuts, because that's what they like to explore the world for, nuts, and so that's kind of what you're doing, except the nuts, so to speak, that you're foraging for are generally abstractions because you're an abstract creature and instead of finding nuts, you find how to find nuts because you're a creature of abstraction and so we'd rather know how to do something as, as Christ said in the New Testament actually said, if you teach a man, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, if you teach him how to fish, then you feed him for a lifetime and that's kind of the same idea. It's like, would you rather have a fish or would you rather know how to fish? And we would rather know how to fish and that's abstraction. And so when we forage, we forage for abstractions because they're worth more than the concrete things they represent. And so our foraging systems, which are in black on this diagram, have evolved to forage not for things, but for how to get things. And so if you talk to someone, they tell you how to get a bunch of things, you're really thrilled about that and you'll pay them. And so, so then I would say, well, there's some relationship between doing something and exploring to figure out how to do things. And here's the, and, and then I would say, Jesus, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out all things considered, what's more important, doing things or figuring out how to do them? And the answer to that is, never do things in a way that stops you from figuring out how to do more things. Got it? Right. Well, that's, that is morality. 